If you were to ask me what the two most important films in my life were, I would say 1975's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and 2013's Rhymes for Young Ghouls. I watched both of these films at vastly different points in my life, but both directly impacted my life as an indigenous person. On the surface, these stories are more different than they are alike, but where their similarities intersect is nothing short of magnificent. Both films feature an indigenous character trapped in an institution that is built to contain and oppress them. Chief Bromden, played by Will Sampson, is an institutionalized Native American man with an unknown mental illness who pretends to be deaf and mute to avoid harassment. Ayla, played by Davery Jacobs, is a young girl living on an Indian reservation who sells drugs to pay off corrupt Indian agents so that she won't be sent to a residential school. Chief is a prisoner in a hospital run by white men and women in positions of power who can brutalize him in any manner they see appropriate, while Ayla is a prisoner in her own home who is met with violence at random and is never truly guaranteed safety. Both of these characters have endured the loss of friends and loved ones. They are faced with the threat of torture and death at the hands of their oppressors. They navigate within a system that is designed specifically to destroy them from the inside out. But both of these films end with the hope of freedom and possibility. Their stories end with them running into their future stronger than they ever were before. I learned about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest when I was 10 years old. My father and I went on a Florida vacation, and as we were walking along the beach, this man approached my dad, who was very visibly Native American. The man claimed to be a talent scout from New York and said that they were doing the Broadway show of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He was looking for someone to play Chief Bromden and asked if dad would fly to New York with him to audition. Dad said no, he's not the Broadway type. Before we continued on our vacation, he briefly explained who the character was and about the movie that he came from. When we returned home, we stopped by the local Blockbuster and picked out a movie to watch, and he found a copy of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. We rented it and we watched it together, and it instantly became my favorite film of all time, in large part because of Will Sampson's portrayal of Chief Bromden. I see my father in this character, even if they have nothing in common. Dad was never institutionalized, he has no history of mental illness, and he was more boisterous and charismatic than Will Sampson's quiet and gentle character. But I loved him as soon as I see him, because I see my father in him. A Native American in a modern world, not a figment of the past, not in his buckskin and moccasins fighting on the prairie as John Wayne murders him. The image of Will Sampson's Chief Bromden bursting through the barred window as the music swells in triumph and victory is powerful enough to make my heart sing. It's powerful because he's a native man who looks like my father. It's powerful because he's a native man who doesn't die this time. In that final scene, he is every native man running to his freedom. But he wasn't me. This is, undeniably, a scene of hope. It is powerful and beautiful and a strong conclusion to a remarkable film, but I am not Chief Bromden in the same way that my male relatives are. There's a connection, to be sure, but also a disconnect. The same way that you can be biologically indigenous while at the same time resembling your oppressors, or how you can find pride and power in the chiefs and warriors who fought against colonization, but go a lifetime without learning about the women who fought and died in the battle of colonization right alongside them. The year is 2015. I'm in my early 20s and I'm nearing the end of my college years. As an indigenous woman still struggling to find my place in the world, I met with the usual familiar obstacles. Racist teachers, racist classmates, hate crimes committed against a native man because of a racist mascot. I'm majoring in film and yet cannot bring myself to dive into many films about native people. I don't want to watch unapologetic racism. I don't want to watch traumatizing imagery. 
I don't want to see men who look like my father be murdered and slaughtered. I don't want to watch native women appear just so they can fall in love with white men and end up raped and murdered. This happens so often and so frequently and nobody seems to be talking about it. That was when I stumbled across a film on Netflix called Rhymes for Young Ghouls. I've never watched a film like this before in my life. A predominantly native cast, a native girl as the main character, white men who are 100% the villains in every way. There is no both sides to this genocide. There's no we must come together and reconcile. And most shocking of all, the film revolves around an Indian boarding school. The kind my grandmother and her sister both survived. The kind my father and his siblings would have went to if they hadn't had a white father. I was attached to the character Ayla as soon as I saw her. She doesn't look like me and our lives are so different that I can't say that she represents me, but I adore her. If she doesn't represent me, she absolutely represents my grandmother and my auntie, Native women who are residential school survivors. How could I not love her? And then I brace myself for whatever is going to happen next because Native women don't survive in movies. Something terrible always happens. In fact, many terrible things happen to this character. Her mother and brother die. Her father is incarcerated. She sells drugs to keep herself safe. She is haunted by the ghosts of her family and is weighed down by the collective trauma of her community. When she is taken to boarding school, we watch them strip her down to the very last inch of her being. Naked, vulnerable, braids cut, face bruised, lips split, and they shove her into a dark hole in the ground where so many children before her never escaped. But she does. Ayla climbs out of this hell, war-torn but undefeated. She doesn't fall in love with a white man who loves her one moment and then later breaks her heart and abandons her. She's not some sidekick or love interest in someone else's story. She doesn't die by suicide or overdose or alcoholism or police brutality or other forms of settler violence. She makes it to the end of the film without being raped, without getting killed, without becoming a wolf that eats itself. She survived even when so many others didn't. At the end of the film, she's looking up at the sky, into her future, hopeful and unafraid, not broken and awaiting her demise. She closes her eyes and for a brief moment looks gentle and soft. She's not in survival mode anymore. Now she can start living. Native women do not get that ending in movies. Native women don't get to be Chief Bromden running to freedom with all of his might and newfound power. This story and this character is a game changer for all of us, but specifically for residential school survivors, their descendants, and most importantly for Native women. She did that for all of us. In 2016, the standoff at Standing Rock happens. I'm on the other side of the planet watching the brutality unfold on Facebook live streams because news outlets refuse to cover it in the same amount of detail. I hold my breath, watching powerlessly as this incident may escalate into a third wounded knee. Am I about to watch natives be murdered by white men with guns in 2016? Are we about to witness a massacre in the digital age? They bring out power saws, riot gear, guard dogs with bloody muzzles, rubber bullets, fire hoses in freezing temperatures, militarized vehicles and weapons, tear gas. They bring a war to unarmed elders, women, children, and other water protectors armed with sage, sweet grass, and ceremonial pipes. It isn't a massacre, but they damn well tried. I'm not an activist in the traditional sense. I'm not a historian, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a filmmaker, but I'm indigenous and there has to be something that I can do even on the other side of the world. 
I start looking for films, television series, video games, comic books, anything that features Native women. I want to find something that's at least a break from all of this. If I can't be there at Standing Rock, if I can't physically do something, then maybe I can just create a space online that Natives can come to without being traumatized, without being reminded of the violence and the degradation. I find myself struggling because while there are great films about indigenous girls and women, there are just as many, if not more, that fall into those same patterns over and over again. A white man's love interest, a side character, a rape victim, a corpse. It keeps happening over and over again. Where are the other Ayla's out there? If she exists, there must be others like her. If her mere existence could inspire this much hope in me, surely it inspired hope in others. So I created the Ayla test, which later becomes the Alinati test, my media metric that is used to analyze and critique indigenous women in media. To pass the Ayla test in 2016, the main character needs to be an indigenous woman who doesn't fall in love with a white man and doesn't end up raped or killed at any point in the story. And suddenly a door of possibilities open. People start noticing. It's hard to argue against this metric when there are so many examples of characters who don't pass. People are starting to look for the characters who do. People start demanding characters who do. It's just a conversation to be had, but it began with Ayla surviving. Nobody embodies a message of hope, quite like Ayla lifting her gaze to the future ahead of her, to survival, to possibility, to life itself. We don't know what lies ahead for Ayla or for Chief Bromden at the end of their films, but where there is life and freedom, there is hope. There is a chance. And for me, Ayla's ending gave me the hope for a better future for indigenous characters. Because native girls deserve to see themselves depicted in mainstream media without feeling shame or trauma. They deserve to watch characters who look like them and their mothers and their grandmothers survive and come out stronger on the other side. They deserve to feel proud, inspired, and loved. They deserve to be heroes in their own stories. Ayla making it to the end of the film with that peaceful, hopeful expression gave hope to me. It made me look for the indigenous women who passed the Alinati test and to tell as many people about them as I can. It made me hopeful for a future where indigenous girls can watch a movie or a TV series or play a video game or read a comic book and know that they can be anything. They can do anything. Their stories are theirs to tell.